The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred days' wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about five thousand in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them, and filled twelve wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. Shortly after Christmas, I gave a homily about uh, all about the Gospel of St. Mark. And that's because each year we focus on an individual gospel as we make our way through the liturgical calendar. We either focus on one of the three gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And each year our Sunday gospel readings come from one of those three gospels. And right now we're in year B, which means that we've been hearing mostly from the gospel according to St. Mark. And we have been since last November, and we will since till, until this coming November. But there are some points in the year where there is an exception to this rule. And this weekend, as well as the next few weekends, we will be hearing from the Gospel according to St. John. St. John's Gospel is sort of sprinkled throughout the entire three-year cycle of readings. And, well, to me that's a good thing, because if you ever try to sit down and read through St. John's Gospel all at once, it's a little difficult. And mercifully, the Church, rather than have priests preach on St. John's Gospel, for a year straight, uh, simply spreads his gospel over three years. So for the next month or so, we're going to be hearing from from the gospel according to John. And not only are we going to be hearing from the gospel according to John, but we're going to be hearing from what I believe to be the most important chapter of the gospel according to St. John. And that would be John chapter 6. The reason why it's important to me is because this chapter leaves no doubt as to what Jesus actually taught when it comes to the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is a huge reason for the differences between the Catholic Church and other Christian churches. Uh, I would say it's one of basically two major differences that leads to a lot of little differences, but for now we're going to be talking about John chapter 6, and so we'll be talking about the Eucharist. So what I plan on doing... Uh, today and probably the next couple of weeks is to take today's gospel passage in a line-by-line fashion and just kind of see what Jesus has to tell us. I uh, I will sort of give you some of my impressions and thoughts about this passage. Not not all of them. There's it take too long, uh, and then I'll sort of summarize in the end what I think the point of of this passage is. So first, it begins by saying. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Now, if you recall the gospel last week, which you might not because I didn't preach on the gospel last week, I preached on the second reading, but the gospel last week was Jesus uh, wanting to take his disciples away to a deserted, quiet place to, to spend time with them, to pray with them. Jesus, in the previous week's reading, uh, had sent them out two by two to be missionaries. And they returned with probably stories of all the great things that they had done. And Jesus wanted them to sort of calm down and just be with him. And that's where our gospel begins today. Jesus takes his disciples 
across a sea, the Sea of Galilee, and up a mountain, and still the crowds are following them. It says, Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The feast of the Jewish Passover was near, and when Jesus raised his eyes, he saw that a large crowd was coming to him. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but this would drive me crazy. Not, not a moment's rest, not a second to yourself. These people are coming out of the woodwork to crowd around Jesus. He can't even have a moment alone with his friends. But Jesus, unsurprisingly, didn't respond the same way that I would. Um, he said to his disciple, Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? Now, these people that Jesus is talking about are the same people that would leave him four Sundays from now. Uh, I bet you can't wait. Uh, we'll be hearing about how some of these people, they can't accept his words, and so they leave. They reject what he has to say. And they leave him, and people will continue to leave him all until he's completely alone, hanging on the cross. Jesus knows all of this, and yet his first concern is, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? Now, that wouldn't be my first words, but they are his and they're his first words because God is so good. Jesus' greatest concern is feeding us. It was back then on that mountaintop in John chapter 6, and it is still to this day he desires to feed us, to nourish us. And so we know it's coming. We've heard the story a million times, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, interestingly, this miracle is the only one of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels. In fact, in Mark's Gospel, it's recorded twice, which leads me to believe that uh, Jesus did this a few times, a number of times throughout his public life, sort of like uh, one of his greatest hits. Um, and that would make sense because of what I, the, the summary of this whole passage is going to be. And that is that Jesus is preparing his disciples to do the same. So he would do it over and over again to train them. And so now um, we continue with the story. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? And this is the last time that the fish are mentioned with any you know, meaning, meaningfulness behind them. And that's sort of an important detail because the whole point of this miracle is about the bread. And it's about the bread for a reason. And that's where we have to start talking about the Eucharist because that's what this passage is actually about. Um, it's unavoidable to reflect on this passage without thinking of the Eucharist. Now notice, as I said before, it, it mentions that the Jewish Passover was near. And that's seemingly out of place. Like, what does this have to do with this passage? Well, uh, it is important. The, the, this event, the feeding of the 5,000, is meant to tie into another event that happens later on in the Gospel, and that would be the Last Supper, which happens at the Jewish Passover. And so from here on out, we have to kind of make this connection between these two events because they are linked together, and I'll sort of try to explain why. Um, in the Eucharist, which was instituted at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me, we have the same thing happening as what happened at the feeding of the 5,000. Feeding of the 5,000 is sort of an image or an allegory of the, the Eucharist, or a foreshadowing, I guess you could say. Not only does each piece of bread uh, at, that's consecrated at Mass become the entire Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, so that every single one of us receives all of Jesus, but actually every piece, every particle of that bread contains the whole Jesus. So even if you just received a crumb of the Eucharist, you'd receive all of him. So literally at the Mass you have the multiplication of loaves every single time you attend Mass, every, some, every single time you receive the Eucharist. So, to confirm things, Jesus says this, or the Gospel of John says this, Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining. Now this is a foreshadowing of another time that Jesus would take bread and give thanks and break it and give it to his disciples. And these words, of course, mirror the same words as the Last Supper, where Jesus takes bread and gives it to his disciples, says the blessing, and says to them, do this in memory of me. 
And by this, he doesn't just mean to do this in my memory. After I'm gone, just do this so you can remember me by this. He uses the Greek word in John's Gospel, which is originally written in Greek, the Greek word anamnesis, which indicates that he's referring to this Old Testament idea of a memorial, which is different than just remembering something. A perpetual memorial, as it says in the book of Exodus, the celebration of the Passover was for the Jews a perpetual memorial, something to be celebrated for all time, to make present an event that happened in the past present to us in the here and now. And that's what the Mass is. And so you can connect these two, the Eucharist, feeding of the 5,000, and the Last Supper. The feeding of the 5,000 and all of the other times that Jesus performed this miracle was in part to prepare his apostles to do the same thing in the Eucharist after Jesus was gone. The word Jesus uses in chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel when it says he gave thanks is the word, the word in Greek is Eucharisto. And so just like the Last Supper, Jesus gives the loaves to his disciples, not to the crowds directly. His disciples are the ones who will continue to distribute, to continue this perpetual memorial, this Eucharisto, well after Jesus is gone. And in fact, the descendants, the inheritors of the apostles, which are today's bishops, and their personal representatives, which are the priests, we still do this. We distribute the bread of the Last Supper to this day. We do this in memory of him. And so the passage continues. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. So this gift from God, this gift of his only son in the Eucharist will never run out. God always gives in abundance. 12 baskets of leftover bread, that's a lot of bread. Uh, one for each apostle, one for each apostle to bring that bread, that Eucharist, to every corner of the earth throughout all of history. And to start wrapping things up, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, truly this is the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Now if you recall just a few minutes ago when uh, Sandra read the first reading for us from uh, the Old Testament, we have words that that passage makes more sense now because it says, a man came bringing to Elisha 20 barley loaves made from the first fruits and fresh grain in the ear. Elisha said, give it to the people to eat. But his servant objected, how can I set this before 200 people, before 100 people? And yet he does it. So in the Old Testament, we have 20 loaves divided among 100 people. And this man can't believe it, that five people can share an entire loaf of bread. It's amazing. Now, they must have been small loaves, I guess. But, uh, well, Jesus is sort of one-upping Elisha, and the people recognize it. That's why they say, this is the prophet who's coming to the world. Uh, he's going to take five loaves and feed them to 5,000. Each loaf goes a thousand ways, with some left over, 200 times the number that Elijah uh, managed to do. Finally, Jesus gets some of that alone time that he was craving. The passage sort of just casually mentions, oh, the people are going to carry away and make him the king. But uh, Jesus withdraws to a mountain alone, which I guess is a lesson for me that eventually I'll get... Uh, I'll get uh, the alone time that I like to have. Um, there's one last important thing that I have to say that will sort of summarize my thoughts on all of this. And, and that is, in John's Gospel, it never refers to the feeding of the 5,000 as a miracle. In, instead, John calls it a sign. And at first that might not seem like a huge deal, but it, it is, because a sign is something that points to something else. Um, a stop sign points to a place in the road where you're supposed to stop your car, right? And uh, the world would be just a crazy place without signs, without body language or road signs, or even, even words themselves are a sign of, that have deeper meaning, a deeper reality. And God speaks to us mostly through signs. 
If you remember back to your catechism class, the seven sacraments are signs. They're signs instituted by God to give grace. And the Eucharist is a sign of the God who handed himself over to us, who gave his life to us. And the feeding of the 5,000 is a sign of the Eucharist. And this will become clearer as we continue on with St. John's chapter 6 of his Gospel. It will become more and more clear that it is the Eucharist that separates Catholics from other Christians, and it is the Eucharist that is the center of our entire faith.